Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we're going to be in Genesis 11 through 17 and Abraham 1 and 2. And we're going to talk about the Abrahamic covenant, among other things. So we are done with period number one. What I broke down at the beginning of this year, the nine periods of the Old Testament, period number one is creation and its aftermath. We now move on to period number two and introduce you to a major, major part of the Old Testament. Now, if you want to humor me for a second, grab your Old Testament, grab your your Bible. So you're holding Genesis through Malachi, and it's about an inch or a little bit more. Now, that's 4,000 years. If I were to ask you to put your finger halfway through the time period, any guess where you would put your finger? Now, most of us would kind of assume that you'd put your finger halfway through what you're holding. Halfway through the Old Testament should be halfway through the time period, right? But halfway through the 4,000-year period is between chapters 11 and 12 of Genesis. So Genesis has 11 chapters that covers 2,000 years. If you want to grab your handy-dandy seminary Old Testament scripture mastery card, you'll notice that Abraham comes around in about year 2000. So Abraham is 2000 years into the Old Testament, but we begin the story of Abraham in the 12th chapter of Genesis. That should tell you something. The Old Testament is not an equal treatment of the 4000 years. Now we've had some wonderful things we've needed to study in the creation. But the bulk of the Old Testament is the story of one man and his family and the covenant that was given to that family. And so now we turn our attention to one of the most important aspects of the Old Testament, and that is understanding the Abrahamic covenant. So we're going to actually begin in the Pearl of Great Price in the book of Abraham because Genesis picks up right about the middle of where the Lord is giving Abraham the covenant. So... Imagine I had a board behind me or a chalkboard or a whiteboard here, and I drew a line right in the middle, and on one side, I'm going to write blessings, and on the other side, I'm going to write responsibilities. That's the essence of a covenant. A covenant is, I'll give you these blessings if you fulfill these responsibilities. Abraham is going to be given a covenant, And every one of us that claims the blessings of Abraham needs to understand the responsibilities of Abraham. When you go in to receive your patriarchal blessing, I know probably what drove you to see the patriarch is you wanted to know personal revelation items about your life. You probably wanted to know about your family or your career, your spouse, and those things that are on our minds. And that's wonderful that the Lord is going to reveal some helps about that. But the main purpose to get a patriarchal blessing is to claim your Abrahamic covenant blessings, because that's the one line that has to be in your patriarchal blessing. If it's not, you get a second one. My dad has two patriarchal blessings, because the first time the patriarch did not include that one essential paragraph. His second patriarchal blessing simply has that one paragraph that claims his heir to the blessings of Abraham, and therefore he now accepts the responsibilities of Abraham in order to claim those blessings. Well, let's make a list of the blessings God offered Abraham, as well as the responsibilities. So turn to Abraham chapter 1 in the Pearl of Great Price. This is where Abraham is on the altar, his life is being threatened, and Jehovah comes down to deliver him. And we'll just pick it up in verse 16 of chapter 1. His voice was unto me, Abraham, Abraham, behold, I am Jehovah. My name is Jehovah, and I have heard thee, and I have come down to deliver thee, to take thee away from thy father's house into a strange land. And we begin to identify some of the blessings promised to Abraham. I will hear you. I will deliver you. I will take you. 
and I will place you in a strange land. So watch as we make a list of letter P items here. That's kind of a fun way to see the promises. I'm going to make these all letter P items. And let's pick it up in verse 18. I will lead thee by my hand. So he says, I will hear you, I will deliver you, I will lead you. I will take thee, I will put upon thee my name. In other words, one of the great blessings of the Abrahamic covenant is preservation and protection. God promises to protect the seed of Abraham. That's not just a, oh, I'm going to, you're my favorites and I love you. It's I'm going to protect you because you're going to do something for me. I'm going to bless you so that you can fulfill a responsibility. But protection is one of those tremendous blessings. And then he says in the middle of verse 18, even the priesthood of thy father. Now, that's not going to be in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is going to hit some of these protection things, but the priesthood part, that's not in Genesis. And it's critical to understand that the Lord says, I promise you every priesthood blessing. That is one of the reasons we claim the blessings. And that's why we're building temples all over this planet, is because Abraham's seed are claiming their blessings and they're claiming the right to priesthood covenants. And that means eternal marriage, that means endowment, that means protection that comes in the house of the Lord. God has promised the priesthood to the descendants of Abraham. And then in verse 18, we get another P word, and he says, my power shall be over thee. My power, protection, preservation, power, priesthood. As it was with Noah, so shall it be with thee. We talked about that last week. What did the Lord do for Noah? He preserved Noah among the wicked. And the Lord is promising the same thing to Abraham's descendants today, especially as we sit prior to the destruction of the second coming. The Lord will preserve Abraham's seed. He will protect us with priesthood ordinances and priesthood power. And while we're kind of listing the blessings, clearly Abraham, and this is going to be all throughout the Old Testament version, Abraham is going to be given a special place. Abraham was given Canaan. You and I, as we claim our Abrahamic promises, are given a place. Now, that's both a physical place and a spiritual place. When we inherit Zion... There will be a place for each one of Abraham's descendants that claims that place in the kingdom. God has preserved a place for each one of us. And then the last P, Abraham is going to be promised posterity. He's going to be told in Genesis, count the dust of the earth. And if you could, you could count your posterity. And that is true of every faithful Abrahamic covenant, Latter-day Saint today. Seed without number. Seed into the eternities. A posterity that numbers beyond our comprehension. And I look at that through the lens of the temple. I mean, whether or not you're married, if you keep the covenant, the promise is those blessings are yours. I don't think this is in any way meant to denigrate those that don't have children or that aren't married. Yeah, that means eternal increase. So those are the blessings of Abraham. Those are the blessings we claim when we receive a patriarchal blessing and commit to following the responsibilities of Abraham. Priesthood, protection, preservation, power, a place in the kingdom, and posterity beyond number. But now we get to our first responsibility. All of those things are ours if we do these things. Abraham chapter 1, verse 19. Notice the word but. He's going to transition from blessings to responsibilities. He says, as it was with Noah, so shall it be with thee. But this is what I need from you, Abraham, and all of your posterity. This is what the Lord needs in the latter days. This is why there is a church of Jesus Christ of latter-day saints who claim the blessings of Abraham. He says, through thy ministry... 
my name shall be known in the earth forever. That's our greatest responsibility when it comes to the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham was put in charge of Heavenly Father's children. And the Lord says, I need them to know about me. Your job is to make my name known among them. Let's jump to chapter 2. Just to be short and right to the point, Abraham leaves Ur to go to Canaan. So in verse 6, I, Abraham, and Lot, my brother's son, prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord appeared unto me and said, so now we're back to this conversation between Abraham and the Lord. And the Lord says, Arise and take Lot with thee, for I have purposed to take thee away out of Haran. I have a place for you, Abraham, and it's a place of protection. But notice the very next phrase. Look for that theme of minister and make my name known, but he's going to add something this time. And to make of thee a minister to bear my name in a strange land. So part of accepting the Abrahamic covenant is the responsibility to go out. We have to go to where the world is. Now, you can make that very personal. Some of us will go to a very strange place today, and maybe that strange place is work or school or the grocery store. And the Lord is saying, make my name known when you go to that grocery store. You don't have to walk in there and be all preachy, but you can go in there and be kind and generous and show the world who I am. Make my name known everywhere you go. But there is an obligation for the Latter-day Saints to go all over this world. You've got to go to Russia and Germany and China and Japan and Australia. You've got to go to all the strange places because they are my children and you are my people and you are the ones that are going to take my message to them. Make my name known in all the strange lands. Mike went to a very, very strange land called Chicago. Yeah. I went to, I went to a strange land called Mexico City. I know just the people listening to this podcast, we've pretty much covered the entire world in our efforts to go out to the strange land. That's a major part of the Abrahamic covenant. Don't you think that the internet has helped the voice to be heard better? I feel like the internet has changed the conversation where people can engage with other people from faraway places. And so I think this can be extended in our modern day to say, okay, how am I influencing people? What kind of messages am I, am I putting out there? Am I being caustic or am I being one who invites a, a discussion towards unity? So I think maybe we can apply this in a lot of different ways. So many ways. Not necessarily going to the soil, but in our daily conversation or in our online conversation. And I love how the Book of Mormon illustrates this with Ammon and Lamoni. Who brings up religion? Not that there isn't a time for us to bring up religion, but in that interchange between Ammon and Lamoni, who brings up religion? Ammon walks into that situation and makes the Lord's name known by the way he acts and serves and loves. That's how we do it. We live the gospel. My favorite phrase that is asked of Ammon, Lamoni says, who art thou? That's when I've done my job. That's when I've lived the Abrahamic covenant, where I live an example to the point where the world says, who are you? What makes you different? What makes you tick? Why do you think the way you think? You have something and I want it, so tell me about it. So that's number two, make my name known in a strange land. Notice the rest of verse six which I will give unto thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. I have a place, and I'm going to bless you with posterity. Verse 8, he continues, My name is Jehovah, and I know the end from the beginning. Wherefore, my hand shall be over thee. That's a blessing of protection. I will bless thee above measure. I will make thy name great among all nations. Thou shalt be a blessing unto thy seed. We need to understand it's not just being a good example. It's not just showing the world who God is. It's taking the blessings of the priesthood to the world so that they can make covenants with God. So the Lord says, here's my third statement. It's in verse 9 of chapter 2, that in their, meaning their Abraham's seed, that's us, 
in their hands, they shall bear this ministry and priesthood unto all nations. You see, it's just growing. First, he says, bear my name. Then he adds all nations or all strange lands. And now he's adding priesthood. Bless them with the temple. Verse 10, I will bless them through thy name. For as many as receive this gospel shall be called after thy name. So even if you're not a direct descendant of Abraham, just accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ makes you an heir to Abraham's promises. So now we get to verse 11. This one's goal. This verse is the Abrahamic covenant kind of in one verse. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Now you're going to recognize that. That's verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 12, where the Bible introduces us to Abraham, it introduces us at this point. But you know that the book of Abraham has given us a whole lot more than this. So now we're up, we're caught up to Genesis chapter 12. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. In thee that is in thy priesthood, in thy seed that is thy priesthood. So there seems to be three ways to be the descendant of Abraham. Join the church, accept the gospel. Number two, accept the priesthood and its blessings. And then he'll list the third one just right here. For I give unto thee a promise that this right shall continue in thy seed, in thee and in thy seed after thee. That is to say the literal seed or the seed of the body. So there's the third one. Some of us are literal descendants of Abraham. My patriarchal blessing declares that I am a literal son of Abraham. But I also have an office in the priesthood, and I've been to the temple and claimed the temple blessings. And I also have accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. So three ways you can be the seed of Abraham. And then this culminating sentence, ready? This is the blessing and the responsibility of Abraham in one sentence. Shall all the families of the earth be blessed, even with the blessings of the gospel, which are the blessings of salvation, even of eternal life? The Abrahamic covenant is to make his name known in all the world so that they take advantage of the covenants of the priesthood, so that all families accept the gospel and obtain eternal life. The Abrahamic covenant is to save families, seal families in the temple, to make families eternal because they know who God is. Now, one interesting side note, when did Nephi and Lehi and the prophets of the Book of Mormon understand the bulk of this covenant would take place? Turn with me to the Book of Mormon. Let's go to 1 Nephi chapter 15. So Nephi is answering questions about the tree of life, Lehi's tree of life. Laman and Lemuel asking these questions. So clearly he's been taught from his father, and he says the following in verse 18. Wherefore, our father hath not spoken of our seed alone, but also of all the house of Israel, pointing to the covenant which should be fulfilled in the latter days. And now he's going to summarize the covenant into this sentence. Which covenant the Lord made to our father Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. So in other words, Nephi understood the concept of we need to bless all the world. Bless them with covenants. Bless them with priesthood. Bless them with temple opportunities. But he knew that the bulk of the Abrahamic covenant would be fulfilled in our day, that we would make the Lord's name known in ways that they never could in previous dispensations. Now, we're going to watch Abraham try and live that covenant and make the Lord's name known in all the land. He's going to go down to Egypt, and he's going to make the Lord's name known. And then his seed will go all over. Just another thought here. One of the meta narratives of the Old Testament is that tension between don't be part of the world, but make the Lord's name known in the world. And I think the Old Testament shows that clearly Israel struggled with part of that, which was don't mix with the world. But if you look at a globe, or if you, especially if you look at the ancient world from an ancient person's perspective, 
Jerusalem was in the center of three continents. You know, you have Europe and Asia and Africa, and and the Levant was kind of like the space between the the places where if empires were traveling and they were going to go conquer another empire. If Babylon wanted to come to Egypt, they had to go through the area of Israel. And so it's almost like God did this on purpose. I mean, if God really wanted the Israelites to be totally separate from the world, he could have put them in Hawaii. Or, or I'd put them in <laughs> Australia to yeah. put sharks in the water, right? Totally, yeah. But... The Lord puts Abraham right in kind of the center of the world. We've got Egypt. We've got Babylonia. We've got Greece. We've got Rome. We've got Assyria. You know, all these major world emperors, the Medo-Persian Empire. And boom, where's Israel? Right in the middle. Right in the middle. As they fight with each other, where are they going to have to pass? They're going to have to pass through Israel. Now, do you see why? The reason the Lord places Israel in the center is so that they can go out and make his name known. That becomes a major theme of the Old Testament. As you make the Lord's name known, he preserves you and protects you. Think of Joseph of Egypt. Joseph goes down to Egypt and makes the Lord's name known. And what happens? He's preserved and protected. Think of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going into Babylonia and making the Lord's name known. And what happens? They are blessed and protected. Think of Paul going into Rome or Greece. He will bless and protect and preserve you. However, there's a danger to putting Israel right in the middle of the world. What if instead of influencing the world, what if they are influenced by the world? What if the arrows flow in, not out? Then you lose the protection of the Abrahamic covenant. And there's the story of the whole Old Testament. They went to Egypt and were very influenced by Egypt. They're going to say to Moses, would that we could go back to the flesh pots of Egypt. Very symbolic. We want to go back to Egypt. Next week, we're going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah and that pull to go back. I can't leave. I really don't think Lot's wife looked back. I think she went back. She could not leave Sodom. And she was destroyed with it because she couldn't let it go. We will talk about 1 Samuel chapter 8 where they come to Samuel and they say, we want to have a king so that we can be like everyone else. And you can just sense that that's the beginning of the whole downfall of Israel, is the world is influencing us. So let me illustrate with Abraham. There is a reason we call this covenant after Abraham. In chapter 13, now we'll go back to chapter 12 in a minute. I'm just going to illustrate the covenant, and then we'll go back and cover a lot of the text that's 12 through 17. In chapter 13, to show you the blessing of Abraham, he has been prospered, he has been preserved, he is a very influential man. End of verse 2, it says, Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. He's been preserved and protected and blessed abundantly to the point where his herdmen and Lot's herdmen start fighting. They're too big for the land they live on. So there's contention, there's strife in verse 7 between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. Verse 8 Abraham says, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you depart to the right, I'll go to the left. So Lot gets to pick first, and Lot picks the plain of Jordan. It was well watered, it was green, And so Lot chose Jordan, which meant Abraham receives Canaan. And now we get to verse 12. Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. The influence starts. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. He's intrigued. And you can hear Moses writing these verses, or whoever did write these verses, saying, come on, Lot, verse 13, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners. Why are you pitching your tent towards Sodom? 
In chapter 14, Battle of the Kings, we'll get to that in a minute, I promise, but in the Battle of the Kings, Lot is taken captive. Verse 12 of chapter 14, Lot dwelt in Sodom. So there's a whole story between chapter 13, verse 12, and chapter 14, verse 12, of how Lot goes from pitching his tent towards Sodom to living there. And that's how Satan works. It's incremental. He lets the world influence you in small little increments until pretty soon you're in Sodom, participating in Sodom. So Abraham conquers the kings that conquered Sodom, and he's coming back from the battle. Abraham has won the victory. He's coming back with all of the people, all of the goods, all of the money, and two people come out to meet him. One is Melchizedek, king of Salem, and Abraham makes covenants with him. That's very symbolic. Abraham meets the king of righteousness and makes covenants with him. But here comes the king of Sodom, who ironically was not with his people when they were captured. And the king of Sodom has a deal for Abraham, a deal he can't even make or keep, which is so typical of Satan. Verse 21 of chapter 14, the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, give me the people and take the goods for thyself. He wants a kingdom to rule over. Give me the people, you can have the money. Now, for me, this is the moment of greatness. And this is what it means to be a descendant of Abraham today. I know we can look at Abraham and sacrificing Isaac and we can say, boy, there's, that's why Abraham was so great. He was so faithful. But for me, this is the moment of greatness. Some of my favorite Old Testament verses here. Chapter 14, 22 and 23. Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. In other words, I've made a covenant. As have I, as has Mike, as have most of you, I have made a covenant that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, that I will not take anything that is thine. I will not let the world influence me. I will live in this world, but I will not let the world influence me. I will not let even a thread or a shoe latchet in. I won't. I won't let in a thread's worth of pornography. I won't let in a thread's worth of profanity. I will not let the world in. My job is to influence the world, not be influenced by the world. That's the Abrahamic covenant. And I find it very ironic that he used that phrase, I will not take from a thread's worth, from a shoe latchet. Because in Second Nephi, this is how Satan begins. Second Nephi chapter 26 uses this very fascinating phrase about how Satan gains control over us. End of verse 22, Second Nephi 26, 22, he leadeth them by the neck with a flaxen cord until he bindeth them with strong cords forever. And if you remember in Moses chapter 7, we saw Satan with a great chain in his hand that veiled the earth. It starts when you take the thread or the shoe latchet. It starts when you let the world influence you just a thread's worth, just a shoe latchet. And then that thread becomes strong cords, which become chains. Do you remember in the Book of Mormon when Amalekiah couldn't get Lahontai to come down from the mountain? He went up nearly to Lahontai's camp. So now the invitation is simply, all you have to do is come down a little. Just come down a little. And bring your guards. You'll be safe. Satan is very good at getting us to take the thread because I feel safe. I can break the thread anytime. Little do I realize how quickly that thread becomes a strong cord and then a chain. And now he has me. So the Abrahamic covenant says, I will make the Lord's name known 
And that, in simple form, is the story of the Old Testament. All right, we left a lot of things out. Let's go back to the text. 12 through 17, there are some wonderful things we need to know about Abraham, Sarah, and as we start to set up this covenant. There's a lot on the table. There's a lot happening here, but I really like that as the big picture. So in this 12th chapter, Abraham and Sarah, they're going down into Egypt. And this descent of going down into Egypt is really important from a from a symbolic perspective. You see, Abraham and Sarah are going on what I like to call the hero's journey. They're leaving the known territory, and they're going into a place where it's going to be an abyss or a place of darkness. And in these next couple of chapters, Sarah is going to do battle with the serpent. And what, by that, I mean, she's going to have trials. And it's going to be right out of the gate. I mean, look in chapter 12, verse 11. In this text, we have Abraham telling Sarai, and she's not Sarah yet, but he says, because of her beauty, you know, to preserve my life, we've got to tell Pharaoh that you're my sister. And so she's She's very... She's a real threat, right, Mike? I mean, that was not... Oh, yeah, this is real, yeah. I mean, you, you see a beautiful woman who's married to a man, you take out the man and take the woman. That was not below what you could expect from... Egypt at the time. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what these kings could do. And and Hugh Nibley talks a lot about this in his book on Abraham, where he says, no, this happened. And so we, we get this where she's fair, and then they say, hey, she's my sister. And then in verse 17 of the 12th chapter, it says that the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. And then Pharaoh in verse 18 called Abraham and said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? You know, why didn't you tell me this? And I'm going to skip to his answer in another one of the narratives. Just know that this is a triplet in the book of Genesis. One time I sat down and and tried to chart out all the doublets and triplets of stories in the Pentateuch, and I found that there's three of these. This story is told three times, and my take on this is these are from different traditions. The Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom had these traditions and these stories, and they're blended into the Bible right about the time, right around 700. BC. And so I'm going to skip to his answer in another one of the narratives. So if you go to Genesis chapter 20, look what Abraham's justification for saying that she is his sister. Now, in this narrative, it's Abram talking to Abimelech, okay? But it's the same kind of story. In, in fact, when we get to Genesis 20, Bryce and I are just going to say, hey, we already talked about this. This is one of the triplets, meaning the story that's told three times. There's a lot of these that are told three times and two times, but just know that here's another tradition. So if you go to Genesis 20, in verse 12, his response is, she indeed is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Now, we actually give you a slide where you can see the genealogical family tree of Terah, and we see that Sarai and Abram are brother-sister in the sense that they're from the same father, but from different mothers. Now, the author of Leviticus 18 is going to say that this is prohibited, but the author of Leviticus 18, I'm going to contend, is not the author of Genesis 20 and Genesis 12. They're different authors. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that the first five books of the Bible have a history, and they probably aren't from all the same author, because if they were, you wouldn't have Genesis 20, Genesis 12, and Leviticus 18 written by the same person. So I'm just throwing this out there, that these things give us clues that there's multiple authors. And so that's his answer in verse 12 of chapter 20, and my take is that's probably his answer to the Pharaoh in chapter 12. But I want to get into a little bit about what happens here. And there's some really interesting things that it's not necessarily in the Bible, but it's in other texts. And so one of the texts is called the Genesis Apocryphon. And what this is, is this is a scroll that was discovered at Qumran in Cave 1. And on this text, it gives another view for Abraham's experience in Egypt. And we linked it in the slides, and we actually link it in the show notes. You can go and read it for yourself. And so what happens is when they get down to Egypt, there's all this stuff in the Genesis Apocryphon talking about how lovely Sarai is and how beautiful she is. And because of her beauty, Abram tells her, you know, to preserve my life, we've got to tell Pharaoh that you're my sister. And so she does. 
and she's taken by the Pharaoh. Now, all of that is kind of hinted at in the 12th chapter, but what the 12th chapter of Genesis doesn't tell us and what the Genesis Apocryphon does tell us is the rest of the story. And so whenever I teach this, I like to get into some of this stuff to say, hey, here's the tradition, and I believe this tradition was known to the authors of Genesis. And I think the author of Genesis 12 is just assuming that you, the reader, know the rest of the story. So here's the rest of the story. She marries Pharaoh. And you can only imagine her prayer when she's in the bedchamber, praying to God, protect me. And so as she prays, Pharaoh comes to lay a hold of her, and he cannot. He cannot. And not only can he not, but his whole house is impotent. And then the Genesis Apocryphon tells us that it was for two years. Think about that. That's a lot different than just a couple of verses in Genesis 12. Imagine her sacrifice. And so I like to call this Sarai's battle with the serpent. She's doing battle with chaos and God protects her. And so after two years of him being impotent, and by the way, in the ancient Near East, being impotent was like a horrible curse. Your, your sheep and your families and your kingdom not being able to produce means you don't have a kingdom. And so he actually comes to Abram and says, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? And so when he goes his way in verse 19, and in, in verse 20, when he's sent away, we pick up in chapter 13 that he comes in verse 1 and 2 out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt, and he's very rich. Now, there's a fun word here that I want to just kind of noodle on just for a little bit. Look in verse 17 of chapter 12, and the word is plagued. That word for God plaguing Pharaoh, naga is the word in Hebrew. The word denotes the idea of reaching out or touching. And so the first instance of this word in the Hebrew Bible is in Genesis 3.3, 3, where the Lord says of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. And so don't touch it is the, is the conjugation of naga. Well, the author of Genesis 12.17 is, I think, doing a play on words. The Pharaoh wants to touch Sarah, and the Lord reaches out and touches Pharaoh. Now, it doesn't say this in Genesis 12, but my take on this, I'm going to read this through the lens of the book of Abraham. Because of this experience, God touching Pharaoh in this instance, Abraham is able to teach Pharaoh the gospel of Jesus Christ. And more. I mean, he teaches him about the cosmos and everything. Totally. And the author of Genesis 12 could have used a different word, but the word Naga is this idea of God reaching out and touching Pharaoh. And I got to tell you, I see that in a lot of ways. You see Pharaoh, in a lot of the iconography of Pharaohs, they would have on their forehead a serpent. And so I, that's the image I have in my head, is that this is another repackaging or another story of Eve in the garden. Sarah is Eve, and she's doing battle with the serpent. This is the hero's journey, and this is the female version of the hero's journey, meaning Abraham's going to have his. When we get the sacrifice of Isaac, that's going to be his sacrifice and his trial, but this is Sarah's, and it's such a big deal that it's repeated three times from different perspectives. And so my point is, whoever the authors were, you know, whether you call them E or J or however you, know, you get into the biblical scholarship, the idea is that these people that preserve these stories kept her legacy alive. Also in the idea that she is doing what Bryce is talking about. She's making God's name known and she lays herself on the altar. Now the early rabbis really beat up Abraham on this and they kind of take him to task. You see, if you read Genesis 12, it's Abraham's idea. Hey, you say you're my sister. But in the book of Abraham, God also tells Abram, no, you need to do this. So I think we have some really interesting parallels uh, with ancient literature that's not in the Bible, what I call extra biblical literature. So that's kind of interesting. That is way cool. I have never made that connection. That was way cool. Yeah. Chapter 13 is the story of him coming out of Egypt, and he's super wealthy. And Bryce, I love how you laid that out, how Lot and Abram both have opportunities to get together, but there's this strife. And there's this verse in John, I think it's in John, where Jesus says, go do the works of Abraham. And so, Bryce, I think another lens we can use to look at this is how can I apply Abraham's life in my life? And this is a story of like a land dispute, and Abram's always giving the other person the benefit of the doubt. And I think that's something that we can apply in our life, whether it's disagreeing with family members or coworkers. We've got to find a way to be like Abraham to say, you know what, you 
you, you can take it. Like, it's okay. Um, There's now, a justice and a mercy here. We need to separate, but you choose first. Yeah, you can pick the good stuff. And by the way, the area that Lot picks, if you go there now, it's completely wasted. Like, it's just awful. But if you look in the text of chapter 13, it seems to make it, Like, it's beautiful. It was well watered everywhere. Yeah, they even said, look in verse 10, it says, even as the garden of the Lord. I think what that's hinting to is the garden of Eden. I think what that's saying is that Lot picked the space that was most like the garden of Eden. And maybe I'm reading too much into the text here, but I think the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is going to show because of their behavior, the garden becomes barren. I think that's a great figure or a metaphor. Yeah. So... After the experience with Sodom and the strife, if you go to verse 15 and 16 of the 13th chapter, there's that beautiful promise of seed. But then we get to the battle of the kings, the 14th chapter of the book of Genesis. And there's some what I call textual breadcrumbs in the text. Now, this is not the main thing. I think Bryce covered the main thing, but I want to talk about these breadcrumbs just for a second. Okay, so what I mean by breadcrumbs in Genesis 14 is this story is really old, but it's packaged and it's textualized probably a lot later, probably after the monarchy, about 1000 BC. And so, like Bryce said, Abraham's a long time before the monarchy. He's like 1900, 2000 BC, like way before. But if you go to chapter 14, look at these breadcrumbs that kind of give us the idea of when this was written. So look in verse 13 of Genesis 14, and notice that it talks about, quote, Abram the Hebrew. And so a lot of biblical scholars see that and they say there's no way that an Israelite would use that term to describe themselves. And so in a lot of scholarship, they say that this is probably a story from outside Israel that became part of their tradition. Now that may not be convincing, but look at this one. Look at the end of verse 14. When Abram goes to catch these guys that took the people in the city, in verse 14, it says that he pursued them unto Dan. Now Dan was part of the Northern kingdom and they were the tribe that possessed the land right around the Sea of Galilee, if you look at your Bible maps. But the problem is there is no Dan in Abraham's day. Dan is a tribe that doesn't even exist until after the tribes are designated, after Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and after the Israelites come to possess the land. And so this is what we call an anachronism, meaning it doesn't fit the time period. It's kind of like if you've ever looked at that famous picture of George Washington crossing the Delaware River on Christmas Eve, there's a lot of anachronisms in that painting, but the painting's true. There really was a George Washington, and they really did beat the Hessians, and that you know that really did happen, but there are some anachronistic things in the painting. And I use that painting sometimes when I teach Old Testament to say, what the painting does is it tells us a little bit about who the author was, and they're telling the story, but it's not totally accurate. And if you think about this, what I look at verse 14 as is it's whoever's putting this together is taking this oral tradition, and they're putting it in textual form, and they're saying, he pursued him up to this place. It was Laish in in the ancient Near East in Abram's day, but the author's like, we're not going to use that term. We're going to use Dan. Now, like I said, this may not be that important, but it is important when we get into some of these textual issues of the Bible and trying to understand its theology. And then finally, I think the main thing of this chapter is Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, or the priest of El Elyon, as the text says, the Most High El, or God. And so this Melchizedek is kind of a big deal, and I'm going to go through just a couple of things really quick with Melchizedek. Make sure you read the JST edition that's in the appendix that comes after verse 24. There's a major edition to chapter 14 focused on Melchizedek. Who is this? And again, before Mike jumps into this, let me remind you that the Melchizedek priesthood is named after Melchizedek because he was such a model of how to hold its offices and receive blessings from it. So every one of us should be intrigued to know more about Melchizedek because the Lord's basically saying the Melchizedek priesthood, which you all benefit from, well, here's the model of what it does, what it's for, and how to hold its offices. Yeah. But Melchizedek is just kind of like this flyover character in the Old Testament. He's dropped right here. And then we don't see him again, but he's hinted about, especially in the Psalms. So if you go to Genesis 14, 18, there he is. He brings uh, bread and wine, and he's the priest of the Most High God. And then it says, he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. 
and blessed be the most high God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Now, my reading of verse 20 is Abram is bringing tithes to Melchizedek. And obviously, if you read this, there's got to be a backstory here, Bryce. There's got to be more going on that we just don't have. That's right. There's got to be. And so if you read Hebrews 7, if you read Psalm chapters 2 and 110 and Alma 13, 14 through 18, you get a lot of information about who he is. And so I would suggest that it would be worth your time to read that. If I was teaching this in a class, I would probably just use this slide that I'm presenting here in the in the slides, it's the 28th slide, and this slide says, Melchizedek serves as a prefiguring or a symbol of Christ. And you could read some of these verses in class, pick which ones that work for you, to see how uh, Melchizedek was a type for Jesus Christ. And so, if you go to Alma 13, verse 18, we read that he was a king of peace, or he was called the prince of peace, and that he ruled under his father. Think about that. Jesus ruled under his father. Melchizedek ruled under his father. He was the king of righteousness. He administered bread and wine. Think about the Last Supper. The priesthood is called after him, section 107, 2 through 4. And now think about what the priesthood was originally called. It was this order after the order of the Son of God. So that's another type, how he represents the Savior. Uh, He brought a horribly wicked society into a repentant state. And Bryce, I think when we talked about Alma 13, you really laid that out there, as that was an important part of the message. That's why Alma is saying that in Ammoniah, because he's saying, look, we can turn this city around just like Melchizedek turned his city around, just like Christ turned this planet around. Yeah, it's such an important message to understand why is Melchizedek being invoked in Alma 13? Just... Think about this. It's just one thing to read Alma 13 and see all the cool things that are taught about Melchizedek, but it's another thing to sit and ask the question, okay, why is this in here? And that question leads me to, it just it adds to my testimony that no 20-something-year-old in upstate New York is putting this stuff together. The traditions about Melchizedek, putting it in the right context of why to a wicked city. I mean, just think about the complexity of this. And then the application to modern-day families. I've got children who are going astray. How do I pull my children back in? Well, Melchizedek is the model of how to do that. And so it's so applicable. There's no way Joseph Smith did this on his own. I, I just don't see it. Now, another thought is this. Melchizedek is lost to us in the biblical text, and yet he's such a big deal And my take on this, and it's difficult to prove, but there's enough circumstantial evidence to make a case, is that the religion that believed in a dying Messiah, a God that would come to earth, die and get resurrected, that religion had to go underground during the time of when the Bible was textualized and edited, specifically around the 7th century. That's my take. And that religious group of followers that held to that belief are still around when Jesus comes. That's why they recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And if you do a careful reading of Hebrews 7, whatever Christian author put Hebrews 7 together knows the Melchizedek tradition, and it's not in the Bible. And they're doing some of the same things that is happening in Alma 13. This symbol of Melchizedek is being used as a type of Christ. And the author of Hebrews 7 makes a point to say, that Melchizedek was a high priest, and then he makes the connection that that is Jesus, the great high priest. And so there's a lot of temple theology swimming around here with Melchizedek that we're not going to do now. We're going to unpack this when we get to the Psalms. But my point is, and this is kind of the tricky one, is that Melchizedek was invoked at the coronation of the kings of Israel, and that this image, this image of Melchizedek, and this is, it's a crassus of these two words, or a crashing of these two words, the words king, and the word righteousness are put together to make this word Melchizedek. So literally, king of righteousness. This image of this individual was used at the coronation of the kings of Israel and tied them to Christ and the promises of the temple. And my take on Psalm 2 and 110, if you do a careful reading, is that this was in a way when the king was coronated, it was as if the people were saying to the king, you better be like this. You better be a king of righteousness because everything hangs on it. And this is where we get into modern temples. When we receive the blessings of the temple, those same ideas are invoked on us, that we are invited to be 
Melchizedek priests, kings and queens of righteousness. And if you do a careful reading of Psalm 110 and Psalm 2, that's going on. So we'll get more into the weeds on that when, when we get to the Psalms. But just know that all this stuff's swimming around, and it's just dropped in a couple of verses in, in Genesis 14, and then we're, we're moving on. So Genesis 15, I like to say this is a way that Abraham is giving God the benefit of the doubt. And so if you look in the first couple of verses, Abram's getting really old, and I think he's saying to the Lord, um, am I really going to have kids? Like, is this literal? And so how about this, Lord? How about you give seed to my servant, Eleazar, and then when I die, my estate, my land holdings will be given to him. Now, biblically, they could do that in the, in the cultures of the ancient Near East. It could work that way. And so he says, is this kind of what you mean when you say I'm going to have seed? Because in verse 3, I don't have seed. I don't have anybody born to my heir. And I'm really old. Yeah, it's just not going to happen. And verse 4 says, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And then the promise about tell the stars. So that's him trying to fulfill it. And then in 16, it's Sarah's idea. Hey, let's have Hagar do it. She'll fulfill the promises. But when we read section 132, the Lord says, no, I told her to do this. And so the text doesn't agree, but I just want to acknowledge it and kind of let it sit. But what I see it as is they're both trying to find a way for God's word to be true. They're giving him the benefit of the doubt. And we can do that in our relationships right. where your spouse says something to you and you're like, okay, you can look at that negatively or you could give them the benefit of the doubt. Because that's really what I see them doing is like bending over backwards to make God's word true. And I think sometimes we do that with scripture where we find something and we're like, well, there's a contradiction and we just like throw it out the window and the Lord's like, dude. Yeah, this is a great lesson. He's doing his very best to fulfill the promises of God. What can I do within my power to make that promise come true? Rather than sitting back and wait, putting it all on God and saying, how are you going to fulfill the promises? Instead, he says, I'm going to take some ownership. And I think that's so significant for all of us to say, how can I fulfill the promises the Lord has made? What can I do within my realm of influence to make that happen? Now, clearly, Abraham's idea doesn't compare to God's idea, but bless Abraham for saying, I'm going to do something to bring about the blessings. I like that. I, I totally see that happening. And so in the seventh verse, God reveals his name to him. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur. Right there, I am Jehovah. That's the big reveal where he tells him his name. Now, this is going to be different than what we're going to read in the 17th chapter. That's why I'm kind of making a big deal about this, because in the 15th chapter, he tells him his name. And in the 17th chapter, we get a different name, El Shaddai. That's Hebrew. So just put a pin in that. We're going to hold for just a minute, because we're going to unpack this stuff going on with these animals. These animals that are being cut in half. And the idea in Genesis 15 is that God tells him to do this, and then he's to pass between the pieces. And so a lot of times students of the Bible read this and go, this is really weird. It's kind of foreign. So what does it mean? Now, this is one possible interpretation. I'm just going to read this from the Jewish study Bible. I think it's very helpful. The ritual of cutting animals in half and passing between them is found in both the Bible and Mesopotamia. The parallel is found in Jeremiah 34, 17 through 22, and it makes it likely that the essence of the ritual is a self-curse. Those walking between the pieces will be like the dead animals if they violate the covenant. In the case at hand, remarkably, and this is what's interesting, it is the Lord, symbolized by the smoking oven and the flaming torch, Genesis fifteen seventeen, who invokes the self-curse. So look at verse 17. It came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp. There's a lot of different ways to read that, but just what I want to invoke in your minds is this bright presence. It passed between the pieces. Go to verse 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, unto thy seed, I have given this land. What is happening in verse 17 and 18 is God is telling Abram, not only are you going to have seed, but you're going to have so much that it's going to possess a great piece of land, a lot bigger than we typically think. A curse like this, a similar one to a, a curse like this in Genesis 15, is attested in 8th century treaties. 
And so in Genesis, it's God who walks between the pieces and is suggested here that God is the one invoking the curse on himself if he fails to fulfill the promise. And so this is a big deal in, in ancient Near Eastern literature. And a lot of times it would happen between two parties. They would come to an agreement and they'd cut up an animal and then they'd cook it. And after they cut it up, they would say, if we break our pact, if we break our covenant, may what happens to this animal happen to us if we violate that covenant. In fact, that's even the root of the idea of the word for covenant is actually tied to this idea of cutting. You cut a you covenant. cut a covenant. Yeah. So, so that's going to really bleed over when we get, no pun intended, into Genesis 17. The idea of cutting a covenant and blood is part of this tying yourself to God, but also sometimes between parties that are come together and make agreements. And so this is going on in the ancient Near East. Yeah, let me point out one in the Book of Mormon. It's clearly a tradition in the Book of Mormon. Do you remember when Moroni rips his garment and then basically says, if we break our commandments or fall into transgression and be ashamed to take upon the name of Christ, the Lord should rend them even as they had rent their garments. And then even invoking the, the Jaredites up north, their covenant was, we covenant with our God that we shall be destroyed even as our brethren in the land northward if we shall fall into transgression and he may cast us at the feet of our enemies even if we have cast our garments at thy feet to be trodden underfoot if we shall fall into transgression. It's that same idea. You know, we're going to cut a covenant and say, if we don't keep the covenant, may what we're doing right now happen to us. So they rend their garment just like in the ancient world they would cut an animal in half as a symbol of the consequences of not living the covenant. So I think that really helps to see it in the Book of Mormon. I think Genesis 15 is a little bit clunky, so it kind of helps to kind of see these things explained. Now, I really want to emphasize the depth of this promise, and it's on the 35th slide. And this is the promise given to Abraham about the land. So if you look at the end of verse 18, he says, I'm, I've given your seed this land from the river of Egypt, I'm going to call that the Nile, unto the great river Euphrates. Now that is a, today, modern day Iraq, the Euphrates kind of splits the nation of Iraq in half, um, kind of going from the southeast, kind of going in a northwest direction. So if you look at this slide, we show you the graphic of what that entails, and it's a big chunk of the Middle East. And then if you go to... Numbers 34, verses 1 through 11, we're going to read the promise of Abraham's seed to have the land and what modern people generally think of as Israel, which is going to extend from Kadesh Barnea all the way up past Galilee. What's interesting is the land does actually extend north um, past Damascus. My point, the maps don't match. Uh, the promise given to Abram here is a lot bigger than what's in Numbers 34, leading scholars and myself to conclude, hey, there's textual traditions here as far as who gets what land. That's another way to look at it. But any way you want to slice it, God's promising Abraham, you're going to have a lot of kids. That's going to happen. Now, in the middle of this text, we have this really interesting verse where it talks about a horror of great darkness. So if you look at verse 12, Right in the middle of this experience, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a whore of great darkness fell upon him. If you look on the footnote, it takes you to Joseph Smith history. That's the experience where Joseph sees the father and the son. But in the midst of that revelatory experience, he does have an experience with the adversary. And my take on verse 12 is, I think Abram is having a visionary experience. I think he's probably being introduced to both sides, the light and the dark. And I think the apocalypse of Abraham gives us a way to kind of look at this. The apocalypse of Abraham is a text that the Christians read. And so... It was read in early circles, the Essenes read it, and then a group of Ebionites. These Ebionites were a specific branch of Christian followers, a lot of them that followed James in early Christianity. And in this text, the Apocalypse of Abraham, a figure appears to Abram right after he meets Melchizedek. So right about the time period of this vision. And he gives his name as Yahuwahel. And it means the restrainer of the Leviathan or the person who puts the serpent away. So I think that's a really cool name for Jesus. And so this individual tells Abram that he'd been appointed to guard him and his heirs. And then I like this part to reveal to the heirs of Abram secret things. 
And Yahweh was a glowing human figure dressed as a high priest with a turban, purple garments, and a golden staff. And then he leads Abram up to heaven to receive visions pertaining to the future. So there's this huge visionary experience that Abram has where he sees the future. And as I read this, it really kind of dovetails with first Enoch literature and also stuff in the Book of Mormon, meaning that prophets are making these covenants and receiving these promises, but they're also tied to visionary experiences. And that's kind of my take on Joseph Smith, that he sits in that tradition. I see verse 12 of chapter 15 as part and parcel of his visionary experience, meaning he sees the light, but he also sees the darkness. Now, you might be interested. Oliver Cowdery gives an account of Joseph, one of the times he went to Cumorah and was not able to obtain the plates. Moroni shows up and says, look. And as he thus spake, he beheld the prince of darkness surrounded by his innumerable train of associates. All this passed before him, and the heavenly messenger said, All this is shown, the good and the evil, the holy and impure, the glory of God and the power of darkness, that you may know hereafter the two powers and never be influenced or overcome by that wicked one. So Joseph was specifically shown power of darkness on numerous occasions so that he knew the difference. He could distinguish between the two and never choose the one over the light of God. I think that's good. I think it's a very similar experience to what I think Abraham is having here. Yeah, I think that's going on. So if you go to the 16th chapter, this is my take on Sarai or Sarah. I see her trying to fulfill the promises. In her mind, she's like, well, I've got to do something about this because I'm past childbearing years. And so she takes Hagar, who is her handmaiden, and she gives Hagar to Abram as a wife. And that's what verse three says. And then it says, he went in unto Hagar and she conceived. And then after Hagar conceives, it says that she was despised in her eyes. Okay. So there's a lot going on here, but I want to throw a couple things out there. First, I'm acknowledging that this is a complicated narrative. We're not going to be able to answer everything here. The second thing I want to acknowledge is section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants doesn't make it Sarah's idea. It's the Lord's. And so we have to read it through that lens. If I was teaching a class in Sunday school, I probably wouldn't even get into the weeds on this, but I would just acknowledge that, yes, it's complicated. But I think a simple way to read chapter 16 is this is Sarah's way of really trying to find a way to fulfill the promises. Now, we're going to get more into Ishmael later in the narrative because he's going to come up again. But to be short and speaking, in this chapter, Hagar flees from before her face. But then she has an experience in verse 9 where she sees an angel of the Lord and is told to return. So she does. She bears a son in verse 11, calls his name Ishmael, and then she returns. And then the author notes in verse 14 that there is this well and they give it this name, Bir Laharoi, and it's between Kedesh and Bered. And this well is like this well of seeing. This is an interesting place name. This well, it's a combination of three words in the text. You have ba'er, meaning like a well or spring, hai, which is life or living thing, and ro'e, which is the active participle of the word for to see, ra'ah. And so it can literally mean the well of the living one seeing me is probably a really good translation. And to me, this is connected to the name of God in the next chapter of Genesis, chapter 17, where we read that God reveals the divine name as El Shaddai. And El Shaddai is going to be one that sees the children of Israel. And there's a lot of interesting things happening with El Shaddai that we're going to get into. But another thing I want to get into in Genesis 6, 1 through 2 is this idea of building. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, see now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go in unto my maid that perhaps I shall build from her. Now, we, the translators put obtain children, but the word bana is this word for to build. And over and over again in the text, especially in Genesis, we have this idea of having a house or having children is actually used uh, with the word for building. So we see it again in Genesis 30. And so in Genesis 30, it says, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, 
Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children. So the Bene Israel, they're the children of Israel, but literally sons of Israel. But then notice what she says, give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. And he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? And she said, here is my maid Bilhah, go in unto her and she will bear a child that I may also have children by her. But the word for it that I may have children is that I will build from her. The idea of having children is directly connected to building. And later when we get to the narrative, when God is speaking to David, he is going to say, if you and your descendants build my house, then I will build your house. And in the Doctrine and Covenants 131, the Lord uses the word increase children and increase. It's increase, it's grow, it's build, it's expand. Yeah, I mean, that's beautiful. So this is happening. And by the way, in the in the narrative of the description of the temple, there's a lot of building imagery. So temples and buildings and building a family, like it's embedded in Genesis 16. It's just in the code behind the English text. This idea of having children is actually connected to building. So I think it's pretty cool stuff. Now, the 17th chapter, this is the token, the sign of the covenant, and it's the first time we're going to read in the Bible this idea of circumcision, and it's literally put on the skin of the males. In other words, we're back to this idea that we talked about in early parts of Genesis about a physical reminder that we are different, that God wants us to remember him. And I think if we read it that way, I think that we'll be able to um, maybe take off some of our modern lenses and read it anciently. Clearly, the New Testament church struggled with this. You know, how literally do we take this? And they kind of worked that out in the grand council that they had in the book of Acts. We put a bunch of stuff in the show notes, but go to Genesis 17, verse 1. Abram was 99, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am the Almighty God, El Shaddai, that's Hebrew, walk before me and be thou perfect. And then the covenant, I'm going to make my covenant and then you're going to be a father of many nations. It's almost like the author of Genesis 15 doesn't know that we kind of just had this experience where God made this covenant. And so my take is this is coming from what scholars call the priestly version of the Bible, and it's not always going to line up with J or the Yahwist or E, the Elohist. And so I swim in this water that Genesis 17 is coming from a different tradition. And what's interesting is six times in the book of Genesis, El Shaddai is going to speak to prophets. And with one exception, when El Shaddai speaks, the blessings are connected to be fruitful, multiply and have children and life. It's all connected to life. And the one, you know, in scholarship, they say, well, there's one exception, but if you do a careful reading of that exception, it's once again connected to protection of life. So my take on El Shaddai is we're connecting this to fertility and we're connecting this to life. And like I said earlier, this is from the priestly tradition. And I want to suggest that El Shaddai, this almighty God that's coming to Abraham, could be a name that could be connected to the divine mother. I'm not declaring doctrine. I'm not saying that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints espouses or endorses this interpretation of El Shaddai. I'm just looking at the words. Okay, so before I talk about El Shaddai, I want to speak simply as best I can about a trend in the Old Testament. If you remember earlier, we talked about this, how the Old Testament doesn't necessarily say one thing that's consistent over time. Some of the messages of the Old Testament will change over time, because remember, it's covering a long time period. And so there's a trend in the Old Testament when it comes to understanding the, the nature of God as God relates to the Israelites. And so this is a very general way to look at this, but there's a general agreement among biblical scholars that the way that the Israelites viewed God changed over time. It's going to start with this idea of polytheism, this view that there's many gods. I mean, if you remember Genesis 1, where it says, let us make man in our own image, that's polytheistic, meaning that there's multiple divine beings. Sometime around Moses and his day, 
there become this idea of what's called henotheism or monolatry. And that's just a fancy way of saying that the Israelites, you know, sometime between 1500 and 700 BC, they would acknowledge that there were gods of other lands. So for example, if you went to Edom, there was a god in Edom. If you went to Egypt, there were gods of Egypt. And they were kind of acknowledging the existence of these gods, but that Yahweh or Jehovah was their god. He represented them to the world and that they had to represent God and worship him and put him first. And so we read texts in the Bible that kind of speak to this idea. I mean, if you do a careful reading of Exodus 20 verse 3, it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's not saying that there's no other gods. God is saying to Moses, for you and the Israelites, I'm first. Now, we don't read the Bible this way, obviously. We say things like, well, those aren't other gods. Um, but to the people that lived in 1500 BC, their worldview was a little bit different than ours. And so there's a large body of evidence which suggests that they had this view of the world. It's kind of like uh, if you like chicken sandwiches, and I were to say to you, the only place to get chicken sandwiches is Chick-fil-A. Now, if I said that to you, you may choose to disagree. You might say, well, Mike, no, there's Raising Cane's or there's McDonald's. So you might come up with other restaurants. So if I were to say the only place is Chick-fil-A, we would have that conversation. Acknowledging that other places have chicken and sell chicken sandwiches is monolatry. And that's kind of how many people thought of God in the ancient Near East. In other words, we have our God, you guys have yours. Sometime about the seventh century, there's this strong push towards monotheism. And we read this in Isaiah 44, verse 6, where we have God saying to Isaiah, I am the first and the last, and besides me there is no God. And so later, Christian authors will take these ideas of monotheism, and they will say that the other gods of the Old Testament weren't gods at all, but they, they were demons. It's very interesting. But you see, even understanding God changed over time, even after the 7th century. See, by the time you get to the time of Christianity, Early Christians understood and knew of a father, a divine father, and a divine mother. They do talk about her. They talk about a son, meaning Jesus Christ, and they speak of the Holy Ghost. But by the 4th century CE, so 4th century AD, our time, Christians kind of started to change their view of God, and they worked to view the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and to try to put that into what I call a monotheistic box. They wanted to maintain the essence of the New Testament, so we have Jesus praying to his Father, we have the Holy Ghost, but they really wanted to somehow put this into a monotheistic statement. And so the Trinity, or the idea of a Trinity, kind of came out of the fourth century, and the Divine Mother was lost. Now, the iconography of the Divine Mother stayed. We have Mary, and a lot of our... Um, old churches, and she's venerated still in Christianity amongst many of our Christian neighbors. But the idea of the Divine Mother kind of took a back seat. And so by the time of the 4th century and the 5th century, as these creeds are solidified, by the time you go another thousand years and you get to Joe Smith's day, the anthropomorphic descriptions of God in the Bible are largely considered metaphors or figurative expressions. Like they don't really believe that God has a body. Why? Well, because Father, Son, Holy Ghost is this this one essence. So, you know, what we just did in that last couple of minutes, that last five minutes, is we've just kind of walked you through thousands of years of history. And this is, in large measure, a generalistic statement. I mean, if you want to know more about this, a couple of texts I would suggest that you read would be Margaret Barker's The Mother of the Lord. And then we referenced a couple of texts by uh, a great author by the name of Mark Smith. He's done a lot of studies on early Israelite religion. He wrote a great book called The Origins of Biblical Monotheism, Israel's Polytheistic Background in the Ugaritic Texts. And another one, I love this guy, his name's Peter Enns, and he wrote a book called How the Bible Actually Works. And we, I cite some of their stuff in the footnotes and the show notes so you can read for yourself. I think Enns and Smith do a really good job of laying out the arguments. We're not going to lay them all out here because the podcast would be four hours, but just know that this is happening, that early texts have this polytheistic view. And my take is Genesis 17 is swimming in that water that we have in the 15th chapter we have Yahweh speaking clearly it's right there we've covered it and now we have El Shaddai 17th chapter two different names now if you go to Exodus 6 in Exodus 6 Moses sees God he actually sees God twice and so to me 
The 17th chapter of Genesis is P, the priestly author. Exodus 6 is the priestly author. And Exodus 3 is a different author. It's E. So if you go to 6, in the 6th chapter of Exodus, the author is acting like chapter 3 of Exodus didn't even happen. I mean, if you read Exodus 3, God reveals himself to Moses. But then we have it again in the 6th chapter. And if you go to verse 3, I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name of El Shaddai, God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah, I was not known unto them. Now, this is so confusing. If you read the Bible as the same author wrote this whole thing, this makes no sense. Because all the way through Genesis, over and over again, God's saying, my name is Jehovah, or my name, my name is Yahweh, all the time. I mean, we just read it in the 15th chapter. And yet, here we go in Exodus 6, and God is speaking to Moses, and he's like, here's my name. It's El Shaddai. So my take is, is that the priestly author has a different theological lens, a different view of who God is, and whoever put the Bible together put the sixth chapter after the third. They put the priestly author in his version of Moses having this experience after the version in Exodus 3, and it kind of gets washed out, and we miss what's happening. Now, we'll cover more of this later when we get to Exodus 3, but my point is I'm trying to illustrate the complexity of the text without making it too complex. So go to Genesis 17. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, these are other places where El Shaddai speaks to mankind in Genesis. You go to Genesis 28.3, 35.11, 43.14, 48.3, and then my favorite is the 49th chapter. In the 49th chapter of Genesis, this is called the Testament of Jacob. Exodus 49.24. Look at this blessing. By the way, it's really starting in verse 22. This is Jacob's blessing to Joseph, but it's starting in verse 22, but I'm going to skip down to verse 24. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the mighty God of Jacob, is what the translation says. But it's Adir Yaakov, which is the bull of Jacob. That's literally what it says. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. We'll get into Adir Yaakov later. Even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by El Shaddai. Now notice the blessings that El Shaddai is giving. Now El is God. Shaddai is an interesting word. But El Shaddai is going going to give Joseph the blessings from heaven above, Blessings of Tihom, the deep that lieth under, and the blessings of the Shaddaim, the breasts, and of the Rechem, of the womb. And then, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the the blessings of my progenitors unto the bound of the everlasting hills. Okay, so let's do this. What is Shaddai? It's complicated. A lot of translators look at this as this is coming from other languages of the neighbors of the Israelites, perhaps from the word Shadu, which means mountain. And if you get into some of the ways that ancients viewed mountains, or if you've ever heard of the Grand Tetons, the names of mountains are actually related to this idea. Now, Shaddaim is breasts, and that's in verse 25. So there's other scholars that say, no, the El Shaddai is actually the God with the breasts, plural. So just know that Shaddaim and Shaddai, it's basically the same idea. And so if you look in the 49th chapter, El Shaddai is giving fertility blessings. I think that's the thing that's important. And so David Bile, and and we'll link his article in the show notes, he wrote an article on this where he says that all of the passages in Genesis, with one exception, are fertility blessings. And he goes out of the way to show some of the complexities of these things. And he opens the door to possibly that El Shaddai could be a divine feminine, meaning that this is a feminine deity that is giving fertility blessings to the sons of Israel. Now, I want to just say that it's always more complicated than this. And other scholars say things like, no, this is the God of the mountain. But I I just want to put this in your mind, that El Shaddai could be a way to view Heavenly Mother in the text. That El Shaddai, this almighty God that's coming to Abraham, could be a name that could be connected to the Divine Mother. On another slide, we put Genesis 126, where Elohim says, we will make Adam in our own image and in our own likeness. Those are plurals, and Elohim is plural. And my contention is this. If you look at Elohim, which is over 2,600 times in the Old Testament, and if Elohim could represent gods as in a male and a female, and they're making Adam and Eve in their image, If you read it this way, and I think sometimes you could out of those 2,600 times, then I would submit 
that Heavenly Mother is all over the place in the Hebrew text of the Bible, but the translators take Elohim and they make it masculine singular. They make it God. I guess what I'm trying to say is that translation matters. Mike, when I hear all these things, I keep asking myself, have you ever played hide-and-go-seek with a child? The purpose of the game is to be found. If you play hide-and-go-seek with an adult, the purpose of the game is to stay hidden. Adults like the game if you can't find me. Children hate the game if you can't find me. The whole purpose of the game is to be found. And so they hide in the most obvious places, and when you come close, they pop out and say, hey, I'm right here. It is my testimony that God and Heavenly Mother and all things associated with God play hide-and-go-seek like children. They want to be found. They have left themselves in clear places to be found. Now, they are battling the great and abominable church as they take plain and precious things out of the scriptures. But they have left their fingerprints. Both of them, Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, have left their fingerprints. I keep thinking, if you're looking for her, you're going to find her. But it is kind of a game of hide-and-go-seek, and you have to go looking. If you look, they will pop out, and they'll say, here I am, I'm right here. So I truly believe that Heavenly Mother has placed herself to be found. We find her in ourselves, we find her in the gospel, and we clearly find her in the text of the Old Testament. Yeah, I, I think she's there. And I think she's saying things like, this is my covenant, you're going to be fruitful, I'm going to bless you. Look in verse 16, you're going to be a mother of nations and kings are going to come out of you. And if you think about this, Bryce, I'm sure you have this conversation with your kids when they're married and you say, we want children. And if anybody wants children, it's grandma. She's like, I want to see these children. So I just submit to you that that's a possible way to read it. I'm acknowledging that in scholarship, things are messy. We link this stuff in the slides where you can go and read these for yourself. But to me, man, when I see El Shaddai and I see all these covenants of fertility, it opens up a way to view Heavenly Mother in the text. And so I just bear witness that when Joseph Smith is in Nauvoo right before he dies, and he gives some really great quotes where he tells some sisters, you know what, yeah, we have a mother. I put a couple of those in the slides, and they're worth reading. I just want to end with that image of a God in heaven who wants you to have blessings. And then I love verse 16, because I read that cosmically. Kings are going to come out of thee. If you keep the covenant, the promise is those blessings are yours. I don't think this is in any way meant to denigrate those that don't have children or that aren't married, exactly. because we're talking about this from God's perspective. Because no matter how many seeds you have in this life, we are talking from an eternal perspective, seed without number. Yeah. yeah. So with that, we'll close it out. And boy, this was a lot of fun today to talk about. Thanks for sharing your time with us, and we'll see you next week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.